Our text this evening is Matthew 24, 11 to 13. Matthew 24, 11 to 13. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. When the disciples asked Jesus Christ at the beginning of Matthew 24, what will be the sign of his coming and of the end of the world, Jesus Christ surpassed their expectations by giving them many signs. And these signs can be roughly divided into two different categories. First, there are the signs which affect the world at large and nature. We saw those are things like famines and pestilences and earthquakes. And these are the signs which usually get the most attention when so-called prophecy experts mount the pulpits because they are the most exciting, they are the most dramatic, and they are, as we saw, powerful indicators of the judgment of God upon a wicked world. And second, there are the signs which affect the church, and there are three of those, persecution, apostasy, and preaching. They don't all begin with P, but there's a P in each one of them, persecution, apostasy, and preaching. And of those three church signs, you could say, the most important is the preaching of the gospel, which we will consider God willing next time, because that is the one which marks the end of the world. Verse 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's a distinction from an earlier statement of Jesus, where he said, But the end is not yet. Verse 6. That's the most important of the church signs, the preaching of the gospel to all nations. Linked to that important sign are two negative church signs, persecution and apostasy. And they are related in this way. The church is persecuted because she preaches and is faithful to the gospel of the kingdom. And the church is always in danger of apostatizing, of falling away from the truth of the gospel of the kingdom. There are those three church-related signs. Apostasy is the most dangerous. If I were to ask you, what is the greatest threat to the life and well-being of the church, the answer is not poverty or earthquakes or famines. It's not that the church members will suffer in an earthquake and lose all of their possessions <coughs> and be left homeless and destitute. It's not even persecution that the members of the church will be hauled away into prisons and persecuted and put to death because, as we saw last time, all the nations of the world will continually hate her until the end of time. No, the most important and the most dangerous is apostasy. Because if the church apostatizes, if the church falls away from the truth and loses the truth, she can call herself a church as, all, as much as she wants. She can have a sign outside proclaiming, we are the first church of whatever, but she is no longer a church because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. The calling of the church is to hold up the truth in the midst of the world to proclaim the truth. And when the church 
falls away from the truth, she ceases to be church. Christ talks about that in the book of Revelation in terms of the golden candlestick. He says, I will come and take away from you the golden candlestick. You will therefore no longer shine in the midst of the world as a church. You will be an empty, lifeless shell which looks perhaps like a church. But because you no longer believe the truth and no longer proclaim the truth, you are not a church in the proper sense of the, wor of the word. And what is the beginning of apostasy? Where does the root of apostasy show itself? In the sign we consider this evening, the love of many shall wax cold. That's the root of apostasy. The love of many shall wax cold. Consider then the cooling of the love of many. The cooling of the love of many. Notice first the meaning and then the cause and finally Christ's promise. In verse 12, Christ makes a startling prediction. The love of many shall wax cold. Here Christ warns that many of those who profess to love him, profess to have faith in him, will lose their fervor. Either their love will fall to a very low ebb, or it will disappear entirely. And that verb translated wax cold is only used once in the New Testament, and it means to be cooled by means of blowing. If you have a hot drink or a hot meal, it's too hot for you to eat. Often you will blow on it to cool it down. And that's the idea here. Something blows upon these people and it cools down their love. It has a chilling effect upon it. And this is a gradual process which takes weeks, months, or years. And perhaps at the beginning, the cooling effect is hardly noticeable, but it ends up with a numbness and a deadness. Think of a cold, chilly, icy wind blowing upon something which, at the beginning, is red hot. The wind blows upon that red hot thing, and it becomes merely warm. Now you can touch it without burning yourself. The more it is exposed to that chilly blast, the colder it becomes. Now it's only lukewarm. Then it's cold. Then it's frigid. And finally it begins to freeze. That's the idea of the verb that Christ uses here. But he's not talking about the cooling of hot coffee or leaving a hot pie on the windowsill to cool down by means of a cool breeze. He's talking about something much more serious, the cooling of love. And specifically, the cooling that a professing Christian and a professing Christian church has for Christ and therefore for God in Christ. That's the meaning, the solemn meaning of the word of Christ here. The love of many shall wax cold. Many, says Christ, will appear for a time and will also profess to be fervently and passionately in love with me. But over time, a cold wind will blow upon them and that love will cool down to be mere affection. And if that spiritual declension is not stopped urgently, mere affection becomes a kind of distant coolness, indifference, and disinterest, until finally a numbness, a coldness, and finally a kind of spiritual hypothermia will set in. 
And with this cooling of love for Christ comes a cooling of love for others, for one's neighbor, and especially for one's neighbor in the church, for fellow Christians. Because we cannot love our fellow believers in the church, and we cannot love our neighbors unless we first love Christ. Now this text, verse 12 in particular, is a warning. And it ought to be something which will fill us with alarm at the possibility that our love for Christ could be cool. That our love for Christ, which should be hot and fervent, could cool down to a low ebb. Because love for Christ is the heart of true religion, the heart of true Christianity, of Christian piety. Love for Christ is more than loving what Christ will give us. It's more than speaking well of Christ or admiring Christ from afar. You know what the word love means. It means to breathe after an ardent devotion. To hold someone as precious and dear. To treasure that person. To delight in that person. To have that person as the supreme object of one's heart. And that is the calling of the Christian. Christ must be the supreme object of our heart, which means we must desire to please Christ above all. We must love to spend time with Him, to be close to Him, to enjoy sweet communion and fellowship with Him in the covenant of grace. And that love for Christ must be an exclusive love. He will not tolerate that we should love others besides Him. And our loving of others, human beings upon the earth, is only for the sake of Jesus Christ. We must therefore serve Him faithfully, obey Him out of gratitude to what He has done, and have no rivals, tolerate no rivals to Him in our affections, because he is the Son of God, the altogether lovely one, and the Savior of his people. And yet, says Christ, the love of many shall wax cold. We must use the word of God tonight, therefore, as a kind of spiritual thermometer. Is our love for Christ hot, warm, lukewarm, in danger of cooling, or already very cold. Because this disease, I will call it, the cooling of love, is the most serious spiritual malady we could possibly have. Better, far better, for us to be poor. To have a horrible disease, to suffer persecution, all kinds of affliction, rather than be sick with this malady, the cooling of love, which Christ says will afflict many. The love of many shall wax cold. Because remember, beloved, this is the way Christ will measure us. This is the test that Christ uses. In the Bible. Do you love me? He says. Is your love for me hot? Is it fervent? Or is it cold? That's what he said to Peter. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thy me? John 21. And remember his rebuke to the church in Ephesus, a church which was doing all kinds of things really very well, but his one thing he had against them, which was a devastating rebuke to them, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Revelation 2, verse 4. 
And so love must be the motive behind all of our Christian activity. We must attend church because we love Christ. We must keep the commandments of God because we love Christ. We must hold to the truth because we love Christ. We must defend the truth against error because we love Christ. We must witness to our neighbors because we love Christ. Any other motive for our activity is a false motive. It must be we love Christ. But how do you measure love for Christ? What is the thermometer that we can use to tell us are we hot or cold or lukewarm or dangerously cold? Because there are various ways of measuring which are to use a false thermometer and therefore to deceive oneself. So imagine you can measure love for Christ simply by activity. If a person is active in church, active in the community, active in all kinds of projects, that person loves Christ. Now you might love Christ. That's one important thing that a Christian should do. He should be active, but that's not the way to measure love. Other people say you measure love by the loudness of one's profession. The person says loudly, I love Christ. If he wears the right kind of t-shirt with the badge on it, I love Christ. If he gets excited in worship, he says, I love Christ. And those kinds of people often will accuse other Christians who are less bubbly and emotional and exuberant types Oh, you're cold. You don't have a true love for Christ. But that's not really the way to measure love for Christ either. Think of love for Christ and the Christian life somewhat like a marriage. A man and a woman are married for many years and they have a deep, passionate, heartfelt love as a couple. Perhaps they're not frothy, perhaps they're not exuberant as they were when they were dating or when they were newlyweds, but they have a deep, passionate love for one another and they have grown in affection for one another over the course of time. Because they have gotten to know one another. Remember in the Bible, love and knowledge are intimately connected. Love is measured by knowledge, not intellectual knowledge necessarily, but knowledge of Christ, of his person, of his perfections, and of his works. One who loves Christ does not simply fall in love with an idea, a sentimental fantasy about Christ, or an experience he says he had with Christ. But one who loves Christ loves him because of who he is and what he has done. And here is a test. How much do you know about this Christ that you profess to love? And more importantly, how much do you desire to know more about this Jesus Christ that you profess to love? How much do you seek after Christ? How much do you love the truth of the scriptures which reveals to you who Christ is? How much do you love Christ's people, the church? Let no one say, therefore, that he loves Christ who is indifferent to the truth, who does, who does not care about the truth, does not care about learning or knowing the truth and is willing to sell the truth or any part of the truth in order to have an easier life to please his family or his friends is not willing to obey the truth because the truth and Christ are inseparable remember Christ said I am the way the truth and the life you cannot love Christ 
are not of his truth. The truth affects what you know about Christ and what you think about Christ and how you live to the glory of God by Christ. And Christ says here, there will be in the church, in the professing church, a decrease of love for Christ. Widespread apostasy, therefore. Widespread falling away from Christ and falling away from the truth of Christ. And that, says Christ, is an outstanding sign that I am on the way. A sign of my second coming is that the love of many in the church shall wax cold. Apostasy. Apostasy is falling away from the truth because churches and individuals within those churches do not love the truth. And by not loving the truth, they are proclaiming very loudly they do not love Christ who is revealed in the truth. Those who love the truth do not apostatize. They would rather die than give up the truth and therefore apostatize. And 2 Thessalonians 2 is the classic passage on the subject of apostasy in the New Testament. In verse 3 we read in 2 Thessalonians 2, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away, first that word is apostasy, a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. And verse 10 gives us the root of this apostasy, of this falling away. Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. So ask yourself a question. Why does a church which professes to believe in God embrace false doctrine? Why does a church begin to deny cardinal doctrines of the faith? And the answer is because they do not love the truth. And the root of that is they do not love Christ. They might call themselves a church of Christ, they might rightly proclaim to be Christians, but if they do not love the truth, they do not love Christ. More important to such a church than the truth, the truth of Christ, is man. It's a man-centered church which does not believe the truth. Because the truth will upset man. The majority of men and women will be upset by truth. So man's feelings are more important than the truth. And therefore, man's feelings are more important than Christ himself. Man's convenience is more important than the truth, and therefore more important than Christ himself. There's no love for Christ, therefore, in the false church. And remember, too, apostasy is the falling away of professing Christians and professing Christian churches. Unbelievers do not apostatize. Atheists do not apostatize. Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, and other false religionists do not apostatize. Their love does not grow cold because they never, in any sense, had love for Christ to begin with. But it's different in the visible church. 
Because there you have men and women who say and make a loud profession too that they love Christ. And for a while they are excited about Christianity. They become members of the church and are enthusiastic for a while. They are like the hearers in the parable of the sower who have no root. And then their love grows cold. A cold blast of an icy wind blows upon their professed love for Christ and they leave the church, they leave the truth, and they leave Christ himself because they have no love of the truth and they really have no love for Christ at all. And Christ warns us here that as his coming approaches, the spiritual temperature of many, even of the majority of professing Christians, will dramatically decrease. They will have grown up, perhaps, in the sphere of the church, but their interest in Christ will gradually disappear. They will show themselves to have no interest, really, in doctrine, or worship, or truth, or holy living. Some of them may still keep up appearances for a while. They may continue to have a profession for a while. If you ask them, do you love Christ? They will say, of course I love Christ. Are you a Christian? Of course I am a Christian. But their life will be exactly the same as the ungodly world around them. They will show no interest in the practice of Christianity. They will not come to church. They will not keep God's commandments. They will not come to pray. They will not fellowship with other Christians, but they will continue to call themselves Christians. Others will become members of the false church. Because it's much easier to be a Christian, so-called, in the false church than to be a Christian in the true church where the gospel of Christ is faithfully preached. And these people will become outspoken critics of the true church and will adopt heresies which attack the very truth of Christ himself because they do not love Christ. So here's the picture that Jesus Christ is painting of the last days. Widespread apostasy. Many people defecting from the true church. Spiritual lethargy and coldness even among true believers. These are signs of the coming of Jesus Christ. And again I say, this is incompatible with what the disciples were expecting and incompatible with what post-millennialism tells us is going to happen. Remember the disciples were expecting an earthly kingdom, Jerusalem, Jesus on a golden throne in Jerusalem, and they would be, as it were, his right hand men at his side, an age of peace and prosperity. And Christ says, don't even begin to think that's what's going to happen. The opposite is the case. You will be hated by all nations. There will be turmoil in all the nations with war and so on, and turmoil in, the nation, in nature as God poured out his wrath upon this world. Many will depart from the church and follow after false teachers, and many will be seduced away by the love of pleasure. Don't expect it to be an easy life for you as you wait my second coming. And post has a similar dream. The post says there will be a gradual Christianizing of the earth. Massive advances in the gospel. Many people converted, perhaps even the majority of mankind converted. True churches on every street Corner, you could say, and this will last for a thousand years at least upon the earth, and Christ will rule through a triumphant, earthly triumphant church, 
and there'll be no fear of persecution or apostasy or any trouble at all. That's not what Christ promises here. And if you ask the post millennialist, well, what about our text? And what about the text you read in 2 Timothy 3 about the last days and perilous times coming and so on? They will say, ah, but the last days, they refer to that period of time between the birth of Christ and, guess what, A.D. 70. And they will say, we are not living in that period called the last days. All of this trouble was concentrated into that period leading up to A.D. 70 and the fact that there is still persecution and apostasy in the world. Well, that was not predicted by Christ in Matthew 24. That's really irrelevant to the whole program. And eventually all of that's going to disappear and the world will become Christianized. Just you wait and see. It's not going to happen. We are in the last days. The last days do not refer to the period of time between the birth of Christ and AD 70. The last days refer to the period of time between the coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ. We are in the last days. There will be a falling away. There must be a falling away before Jesus Christ can come. And that's what 2 Thessalonians 2 tells us. The falling away prepares for the revealing of the man of sin who is the Antichrist himself. And the Antichrist promotes apostasy and really is the final development of apostasy. Apostasy will soften up the church so that she is ready to greet the Antichrist. The church will become so weak and so small that there will be almost no opposition left to the Antichrist when he appears on the scene of history. Just a small faithful remnant who will say no, who will say, we would rather die than deny Jesus Christ whom we love. And apostasy too is the way in which sin develops in the world. Because there's nothing more wicked, there's no one more wicked than an apostate. Someone who once professed to believe in Jesus Christ. Someone who once said, I love Jesus Christ and yet turns away from the truth and goes back into the world or the false church. That person displays the development of sin to an alarming extent. And when we see that happening, widespread apostasy, we know that the second coming of Christ is near. And think of who was standing there listening to this sermon in Matthew 24, Judas Iscariot himself. He was, you could say, the first apostate. Judas was in the inner twelve. Twelve disciples. Christ had more than just twelve disciples, you know, but he had the inner twelve, the closest of his disciples, and Judas Iscariot was one of those twelve who said, like all the other disciples, I love Jesus Christ. He is my master. He is my Lord. And there was Judas Iscariot. And very soon after this speech in Matthew 24, he will show himself to be one whose love has grown cold and he will betray his master for the paltry sum of 30 pieces of silver. Now what possibly could be the cause of this cooling of the love of many in the church. I said there was a cold wind blowing upon the church which caused that church to grow cold in her love for Jesus Christ. And that cold wind is identified in Matthew 24 
as abounding iniquity. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And that word iniquity means lawlessness. That is to say, being without the law and being in opposition to the law, specifically here, God's law. God's law is the expression of his holy will. That which pleases him, that which displeases him, that which he calls his creatures to do. Lawlessness is the expression of man's contempt and hatred for God. Man, as it were, shakes his fist in the face of God and says, I will not have God to rule over me. I will not have his law tell me how I ought to live. I will rule myself and decide for myself how I will live. And lawlessness has always characterized fallen man since Adam and Eve. Lawlessness is the way of life for every unbeliever in this world. But Jesus says, as his coming approaches, lawlessness will increase. It will abound, it will multiply, it will proliferate in the world. Therefore, we don't expect the world to get better and better and more and more moral. We expect, and we see too, the world becoming more and more wicked, more and more lawless. And that's what Paul describes for us in 2 Timothy 3. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, which means without self-control, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. And notice verse 5 indicates that this is not a description only of the society of man, but of the church having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. That's a description of how the world is going to develop in the last days. Wickedness will be unrestrained, and God will increasingly give man over to the lusts of his own heart. Man will not improve. Man will develop in all kinds of ways. Technologically, he will advance. But all of his advancements will be in the service of sin. Iniquity shall abound. He will glory in his sin. He will be blatant in his sin. He will boast of his sin. He will flaunt his sin in the face of God. He will cast off the yoke of God's law and give up all common decency. In the last days, iniquity shall abound. And this process will be helped by false prophecy. Verse 11. Many false prophets shall arise. False prophecy is itself lawlessness. It's against the first and second commandments of God's law. False prophets contribute to and promote an increase in lawlessness. Look at the false church today. Look at how the false church today promotes lawlessness by redefining sin, by saying that we are no longer under the law of God by saying that sin is no longer a transgression of God's law. Sin is a lack of self-esteem, or sin is being intolerant of other people's lifestyles. Homosexuality, that's not sin, says the false church. Adultery, that's not sin, says the false church. Green sins are now the most important sins in the false church. 
not recycling your bottles and so on. That's a sin according to the false church. But not the sins which are set forth in the Bible. And so the false prophets, they soothe sinners into thinking that God will accept them with their sins and without repentance. False prophets proclaim, God loves you and will accept you just the way you are. You can live in sin and still go to heaven. God will give you salvation in your sin and with your sin. You don't need to repent from your sin. And so the false prophet seduces many away from the truth and from Christ in the truth and from a practice of the truth in his life. And the effect of all this, of abounding iniquity and the number of false prophets increasing in the church is that the love of many shall be cooled down. And that's what Jesus says literally in verse 12. Literally, and on account of the multiplying of lawlessness, the love of many shall be cooled down. And here we have what this icy cold wind is which blows upon the church and removes from her her spiritual ardor. The devil blows a cold wind of lawlessness and that causes the church to lose her love for Christ. Just as a man who is trapped on a mountain in the winter in a chilly wind risks hypothermia because he is exposed to that wind, needs to wrap himself up in warm clothing and needs to find shelter urgently so the church and the professing Christian exposed to abounding iniquity is in danger of this spiritual hypothermia. The devil is behind it seeking by this wind of lawlessness to destroy the love of the beloved church of Jesus Christ. And you can see how this works. The abounding of iniquity is attractive to the carnal element in the church. And they show themselves to love sin and all that sin has to offer in an increasingly wicked society more than their professed love for Christ. Years ago, there weren't so many opportunities for sin. Years ago, sin, at least many forms of sin, were socially unacceptable. There was a certain amount of shame to commit certain kinds of sin. Even ungodly society could see that. But now, as iniquity has abounded, it's much easier to sin. And sin is much more accessible as well because you can find sin just by clicking a mouse on your computer today. And the more the church, the professing church, is exposed to this terrible wind, this chilling blast of sin, the more she falls away from Jesus Christ. That was the case with Judas. Money was more important to Judas than Christ. That was the case with Demas. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 10, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And that's the case with many in the church today. Sin has much more to offer. And the more sin has to offer, the less likelihood there is of such people staying in the church. Lawlessness is a bait which ensnares many because lawlessness offers a free, easy, pleasant, enjoyable life without the restraints of the law of God. And so off they go into the world to enjoy the pleasures of sin. And the false prophet said to them, Off you go, God will bless you, even in the world, because God is a tolerant. 
tolerant and a loving God, and with lawlessness and false prophecy, many are swept out of the church into apostasy. But that chilly wind of lawlessness and false prophecy is also a danger for us. And that's really the devil's purpose. He wants to destroy the true church of Jesus Christ. And there's no easier way and no more effective way to cool our spiritual ardor for Jesus Christ than deliberately to expose ourselves to sin. It's like someone who deliberately goes out into the middle of a blizzard and then wonders why he freezes. And sinful pleasures and sinful relationships will make us feel distant from Jesus Christ, will cause our love for Jesus Christ to grow cold, and we will grieve the Holy Spirit. So in a society of abounding wickedness and lawlessness, we must be careful what we watch on television. We must be careful what we read. We must be careful what we listen to and what we look at on the computer screen because all of these will have an enormous effect on our ability to pray, to think good and wholesome and God-glorifying thoughts and to meditate on God's Word. Our love for Christ will be in danger of going cold. And the opposite is true as well. We want to keep our spiritual ardor, we want our love for Christ to remain hot, then we must avoid the chilling wind of iniquity and go to that place where we can be reheated, as it were, under the word of God. Watch and pray. Come to church. Come to church regularly and faithfully to hear the word of God. That's the way in which our love will remain hot and warm. That's the way in which the effects of this cold wind will be counteracted by coming to the Word of God. But the Christian who deliberately stays away from the Word of God, who will not come to church, who does not read his Bible, who does not pray, well, he can expect and God will be just in this too, he can expect to become colder and colder in his love for Jesus Christ. So Christ here has explained and described a dreadful situation which happens in the last days. Many shall depart from the faith. Many false prophets shall arise. These are the things which God's church must endure. And many will fall away, some because of persecution will be offended by that. Many more will fall away because of lawlessness. But, says Christ, some will endure unto the end. Verse 13, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. To endure means to bear up under a heavy burden. And we saw three heavy burdens which must be endured by the Church of Jesus Christ until his second coming. The heavy burden of persecution. He that shall endure that unto the end, the same shall be saved. The heavy burden of abiding lawlessness. He that shall endure that unto the end, the same shall be saved. And the heavy burden of apostasy, he that shall endure that unto the end, the same shall be saved. And notice, it does not say, he that shall escape that, the same shall be saved. He that will be carried away in a secret rapture before these things begin to come upon the earth, he shall be saved. But rather, he that endures 
these things. The church must endure these things. Which means the church must live through these things. The church will experience persecution. The church will experience this lawlessness. And the church will, therefore, experience apostasy. And Christ's calling in our text is, Be prepared for it. Expect it to happen as I have described it. Do not be offended when it comes. And don't say, I never warned you. And don't be fooled by those who say, The end is A.D. 70. He that endures until the end of A.D. 70, the same shall be saved. No. He that endures unto the end of the world or to the end of his own life, whichever comes sooner, the same shall be saved. There will be some, therefore, who will endure. Peter, James, John, all of the disciples except Judas, the son of perdition, who never loved Christ at all, they all endured to the end. And those who are true believers, those who are truly rooted in faith, in Jesus Christ, they shall endure to the end. Not because of anything in them, not because they are strong of themselves, but because of Jesus Christ. By his power, by his cross, we shall endure. And the harder that the devil blows upon us this chilly wind of lawlessness, the more we dig our roots into and cling to Jesus Christ. Because we have no strength of our own. He died for us. His Holy Spirit indwells us. And he has promised to preserve us. That no one will be able to pluck us out of his hand. Because he will not let us go. Even in the midst of persecution and abounding lawlessness and widespread apostasy, he will not let us go. And that's our comfort as we look to the second coming of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we confess that these things are troubling to us as we see the lawlessness increasing around us and the many who profess to believe in, on thee falling away and going into the world. We ask, O oh Lord, that thou will keep us that thou wilt strengthen our faith, that thou wilt rekindle our love and not allow it to grow cold and cause us to be faithful even unto death and to be thy will that we should die for the faith, for Christ's sake. Amen.